What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD in Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for joining us on Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. And uh, today we have uh, Mary-Kate Connor. Mary-Kate is a member of the Icarus Project, and for more than 30 years, she's been an organizer around homelessness issues in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's the founder of a very innovative and progressive uh, homeless services uh, program that focuses on mental health issues called Caduceus in um, San Francisco. So welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us on Madness Radio, Mary-Kate Connor. Oh, well, thanks so much for asking me to be on the show and for being persistent about reminding me that it actually would be fun. <laughs> well, I hope it's I hope it's going to be fun. It's great to have you on the show. I've known a little bit about your work um, through meeting you through the Icarus Project, and uh, homelessness has been um, a topic that we're concerned with a lot at um, the Freedom Center and have talked about on the show before, so it's really good to have you here. Now, you are a survivor of the mental health system. Maybe we could start out by just, I, I want to hear the story about what Caduceus Services um, is all about and what you do and how you work with people and and um, how it was founded, because I know that you were one of the founders of it. Um, but tell us just about your own story of the mental health system and how you got in- involved with it. Basically, um, when I was coming up as a, as I started as a child and I was growing up, I was um, traumatized by a variety of things and some of them were um, medical crises that were ongoing and some of them involved um, sexual abuse and sexual violence. And I had a pretty idyllic childhood in most senses aside from those events, but I think it's because I was not conscious of those events. So by the time I hit my um, early teens, I was really crazy, and I didn't really know it, because what do, you, what do you know when you're that age, just that something is terribly, terribly wrong? And also, what was terribly wrong wasn't just wrong with me. It was very, very, um, very visible in the world around us. That was during the height of the Vietnam War, and because I was from a... Um, my my mother raised us by herself and was um, a member of the American Friends Service Committee. We were very actively involved in um, the movement for nonviolence and for peace. And I was really deeply involved in trying to end the war in Vietnam, which had been going on for my entire life. And I was feeling incredibly helpless and hopeless about it. Um, and all of this sort of culminated in my actually having an I haven't thought about this, and I haven't talked about it publicly, so bear with me, but having what I would call a complete dissociative experience where essentially I chose and then became two different people. And um, as a response to um, a particularly horrendous experience, a traumatic experience. When you say you were uh, kind of crazy as a teen because of this experience with um, the trauma, was that is that what you're talking about, the dissociative being two person or was there a whole lot of different things going on? It's a lot of different things, but I think that dissociation specifically was from um, a specific incident of a very violent um, sexual trauma. And it, it really, yeah, go ahead. I know a lot of people may not know what that word means to dissociation, sort of breaking into different pieces. Tell us what your experience of, uh, if you can, what your experience of that was, was like as a, as a teenager. Well, it, it um, dis- dissociative um, disorder, as it's known in the DSM, used to be called multiple personality disorder. And as um, m- the majority of people who experience this condition are survivors of trauma, people tend to do whatever their their brains and their minds tend to do whatever they need to do to survive trauma. And often, what that means is basically having the experience of leaving their body. I mean, I remember when this was happening to me, I was floating above my body and I was on, basically I felt like I was on the ceiling in the corner of the room looking down at what was happening to me and I couldn't feel anything. 
at all. I couldn't feel my body at all, and I was watching it from a great distance. And that's how I survived, and I think it's um, something that people do as a survival mechanism. But after you make that split with yourself, it's very difficult to return to the person that you were. Partially, I think, because you don't want to be associated with the event that just happened, and partially just because it's difficult to reintegrate. And that, that I think, is common for, um, you know, to a greater or lesser extent for many people who have been traumatized. It's also common in other situations. It's not simply limited to trauma, but people describe having, you know, out-of-body experiences when they're having a near-death experience. It's a very um, common thing that we hear about when someone is, you know, in surgery and suddenly their heart stops and they find themselves floating to the light, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a, a complex thing, but I think dissociation in general is a survival mechanism. And I think for some people what happens is that they begin living out the different identities and are not aware that there are several different identities living within them. So you have this sort of splitting apart from yourself and floating away from your own body as a, as a way mm -hmm. of, of dealing with this trauma that you, this violent event that you went through, and then it kind of continues after the event, and this is when you're a teenager. How was that kind of manifesting itself? Were you sort of like out of out of control or doing self-destructive things, or or how was it sort of? Oh, expressing all of that. Itself? Yeah, all of that. And I was doing a bit of that before because, unknown to me as well, I was sort of a, you know, it, if you look at my circumstances from a traditional um, psychiatric perspective, I would say that that was the the onset of what at this point would be called bipolar disorder. And the onset period of time was a really acute level of depression that you know, had a whole bunch of psychotic elements to it, and I didn't know what was going on. Um, I just knew that I was pretty crazy, and people around me knew I was pretty crazy. And fortunately, I had um, a very loving and very progressive mother who actually, rather than lock me up, sent me to a really great therapist who was very patient and very, she was funny, she was, um, she was Viennese, and she was trained in psychoanalysis, but she abandoned all of that and began to work very deeply with children. And um, at that point, I wasn't aware of what her style was or any of those things. But at a certain point in this process of basically unraveling and unfolding and splitting from myself, you know, it was just basically very dangerous for me um, to be, I mean, I was just, I was so out of my body and out of my mind. Um, I would wake up and find myself in places I didn't know where I was or how I'd gotten there or who I was sleeping next to. And I was very, very suicidal all the time. And my therapist told me that she wanted me to go to the hospital. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. I think that's a pretty bad idea. And she said, well, I, I think it's not. I think that you're really in danger, and I think that you need to be in a safe place, and I can put you there if you don't agree to go. And I was aware of that, and because actually kind of secretly along the way, I had been doing huge amounts of research and reading on what it was like to be crazy and lose your mind and what the terrible things that were happening to people in hospitals. And naturally, I was terrified of going to a hospital and you also have to remember the period of time that this was happening, and it was this early, early 70s, 1970, 71, and things were pretty grim still in hospitals. But she, this woman made a deal with me, and I said, I will go, but you have to promise to put me on a strict no-drug order, meaning that no one in the hospital can drug me for any reason. And Why did you ask for that? Were you sort of very aware of the dangers of drugs and oh, how yeah. they were being misused? Yeah, I was terrified. Um, and I think partially because I had grown up in um, Palo Alto, Menlo Park. Um, my mother was a teacher at a community college. And we had, you know, we lived in a shack because that's all we could afford, but we thought it was grand. But I was taking the bus every day to um, school, not the school bus, the regular municipal bus, with guys that were coming and going from the VA hospital. And they were the classic shuffling zombies. And I took this bus every day for three years and got to know a lot of these guys, and they got to know me. 
and sometimes we would talk about what was going on with them. And um, that's where I first heard of shots full of medicine that last for a whole month. And it was terrifying to me, just terrifying. So I was like, mm, definitely, you know, maybe I'll, I'll go to the, the loony bin, but I will not take this medicine, whatever it is. So did your and therapist end up making that uh, deal with you? And did you yes, end up going to the did. hospital? Yeah, and she honored it. Mm. So what uh, happened? I, well, I went, and um, it was horrible for my mother. Um, and I was, you know, she she really didn't, you know, she, she knew that this was something that needed to happen. But um, it was just really frightening for her. And I was, you know, really, really petulant, um, sullen, angry, very depressed adolescent and didn't make it easier on her at all. And she at the last minute was like, you don't have to stay here. And um, I just walked away from her and let her suffer while I walked through the locked doors where she could not come. And it was amazing, amazing being there. It was during a time, for whatever reason, this wasn't a lot. I mean, thank God this wasn't a large state institution. But what facility was it? It was a private facility or a public place? It was a, no, it was a, um, a regular hospital with... Um, two large locked psychiatric units in the hospital. And there were, you know, there were, there were a huge mix of people on the unit that this would never happen anywhere else or at any other time. I think it was just kind of like this freak moment in time. Um, the human potential movement was in, was in great swing. Um, and so there were adolescents, there were veterans, there were, old people, there were drug and alcohol using people, there was this really big mix of people there. And I, my experience of being there was, you know, like, okay, this is it, you finally, you finally, you finally did it, your worst fears have come true, you are in the booby hatch. And I decided as long as I was there, I might as well just be really crazy. And I did what I had wanted to do for the longest time, which was not talk. I didn't talk for three days just to see what would happen and also because I didn't want to talk. And, of course, people began to talk about me as though I couldn't hear. Um, and it was fascinating. Um, and, I mean, it just I could describe it every day. It was a really, really interesting place. And I learned probably more there and made more important life-changing decisions there than anywhere else in my life and met extraordinary people and had a pretty good time for the most part, but I was not on any medicine. And this was when gargantuan medications were used and shock was still used. And, you know, cold showers were still used. And this was a unit that wasn't necessarily um, using those techniques because there wasn't, you know, it's like, I guess we were not as acute um, as, as, I mean, you have to remember the institutionalization took place in California from 66 to 70. It was a movement that started here in California first, and it was started really primarily not because of humanitarian and advocacy reasons, but because of money. And so this was a small unit, was in a giant state hospital, it was close to Stanford University, so the staff were probably more, um, they were younger and more educated. Um, that I'm, you know, there were, a lot of them were students, um, graduate students doing this as a side gig, um, becoming psychiatric te technicians or whatever. But even if there wasn't brutality that I was seeing, what I felt overall in the entire experience was how completely dehumanized we were by the staff in terms of very clearly the staff had been trained to not have feelings for us. And that was appalling to me. I had never, I guess I had never been around adults that were like that. Um, I was, you know, went to a, a progressive Quaker school and was, you know, taught deliberately to think and feel and question everything. And I just was, you know, blown away. Like where, if I'm, to, if I'm ill and I'm here to get well, What's going to make me well? I mean, the first thing that would make me well would be somebody really caring about what happens to me and what I'm doing. 
and the only people that seemed to really care were the other patients. Um, and we had a grand time. There were nights that things were pretty wild there. But so I, it really, really changed my life. And I was there for a total of three weeks, um, two of which were very, very intense and amazing. And there were, you know, I could go on and on about it. Um, and by then I was ready to go. It was, you know, I was done. Um, I decided it wasn't a great career move to be a crazy person. And I saw people that were going down. They had gone downhill since I had come there. And I attributed to the medicine. And I felt like I was really, really fortunate. And then I could still think clearly enough at the age of 14 to know that I needed to get the, excuse me, get out of there and, you know, really aggressively pursue things that were important, whatever they were. But I couldn't get out after two weeks. I had to, I realized, prove that I was well. And there was no test. It was like, oh, huh, how do I figure out what's going to make these people let me go? And basically it was being good, you know, like going to groups and participating and doing art. And, you know, it was very the sort of condescending, uh, allowing myself to be condescended to seem to be what being good and getting well was all about. So I was bored is basically what happened. I got, became good. I got out and it was really amazing. And part of what was amazing was the internal stigma that, that I had, I had had when I, before I went in there from the survivor shame, um, that happens after trauma. It's very common, but uh, then the stigma that wasn't just internalized, it was in the world. Um, was I just felt like people were pointing their fingers at me and people that knew were pointing their fingers at me. It's like, oh, she's the crazy girl. And that unfortunately became an identity that I was really, there wasn't any way to not associate with that. Um, so that's my personal experience and there are many, many, many you know, years after that, but that's kind of the, the beginning of it all. And I guess the biggest lesson for me was number one, um, drugs are not great for a lot of people, but they weren't at that time. They were really bad. And drugs at this point for some people are great in my experience and in other people they're not great at all. And that to me the most central element of um, healing is being able to experience being cared for in a very deep way, deep and unconditionally. And that was what was so taboo about this hospital was that there was, it seemed like people were trained in exactly the opposite. So I kind of figured out that whatever, whatever healing was, that it had to involve primarily, first and foremost, that aspect and anything else was maybe gravy, maybe not. So at that point I started doing as much reading and studying and research as I could and trying to figure out, um, what had happened? Like, what discipline are we talking about, you know? It sounds like your hospitalization experience really gave you a lot of insight and inspiration into what would help and then the f ultimately the founding of Caduceus um, Services. So tell us how you got involved in doing activism and, and um, work with homelessness and mental health issues. After my experience with hospitalization, I knew that this was the work I wanted to do, that I wanted to work with people, and I thought I wanted to work with adolescents. And I did. I ended up going to work at a really amazing, strange, um, completely wacky um, residential treatment center for um, young people, primarily who had been locked up on back wards for the majority of their lives. This was a residential program in Berkeley that took place on regular houses on regular streets. And it was called St. George Homes. And it wasn't a Christian place. It was um, based in depth Jungian psychoanalysis, as well as a whole concept of creating a healing milieu. And it was an astonishing place in looking back at it. And I was there off and on for 10 years. And I received probably the equivalent of a PhD. And at that time, we really were, we had a really intensive training program. And there were, we had turned into, for some students, been able to get accreditation for their work. And it was incredible. I mean, that was the second part of my learning was this really, really intensive focus on 
on healing and all the different things that that means. And How did people get worked with there? What was helpful to them? Well, I mean, it's, you know, everything from making sure that every morning the community gathered together and had a ceremony in which people told each other their dreams. And then um, the elders of the community would give um, the young people very specific tasks to work with on their dreams. And um, that's just one of the things that happened. And there were, of course, really a lot more mundane things like making sure that we got our chores done and you know, cooking and stuff like that. But we also spent extensive time in the wilderness. Um, we also worked with people who had been, young people who had been truly in back wards of places like Napa State Hospital, the big, big state hospital, since they were born. I mean, there was a, a young man there. He came to work he came to our organization when he was 14. He had been institutionalized since he was three. And there was another young girl who had the same experience, that she was um, autistic, among other things, according to the diagnosis. And a lot of these kids came in with, you know, a diagnosis of um, um, mental retardation, when in fact that wasn't what was going on with them at all. And you also need to bear in mind that this was right before the whole um, biopsychiatry revolution where everything was subscribed or ascribed to a biochemical um, malfunction in the brain. So Yeah, I was just going to say for the listeners, I mean, it's, it's you know talking about a, a mental health program that works with people taking them out into the wilderness and people are telling their dreams in the morning and having a community ceremony. I mean, it sounds completely unheard of today, and that is because of just what you said the incredible dominance of the biological paradigm. And there was a lot of really innovative, humanistic, experimental, um, uh, a lot of it was Jungian-influenced stuff happening, especially in California, and all that just got defunded, and then the whole thing was pushed in a different, a different direction. That's exactly what happened. This was in 74 when I started. And John Ware Perry was also doing Diabasis House then, and... You know, it was a tremendously creative period of time. And a lot of stuff that we were doing um, worked, and a lot of it didn't work, and a lot of it was really, really difficult. Um, but I think that a lot of the work that we did was really effective, and it certainly was profoundly influencing in the young people's lives who came to work there. We were all part of a training program um, theoretically. Um, basically, we got room and board and $50 a month. And I would have, you know, basically we were doing it for free and I would have done it for free just because of the kids we were working with. It was really amazing. And creating a community and a family in the midst of community was the most healing thing that we could have done. Just that idea of getting room and board and $50 a month to work in a community like that. Today, that would just sound like paradise for so many young people interested in working with madness or helping people yeah. who are going through crisis. And now, no, no such program exists that I know of. Yeah, and I think it, it, it would be really, really, really difficult to do that. Um, so I'm going to flash forward, you know, 10 years from then when I was 28, um, 29, 30, I came to work in the city um, and to work in the Tenderloin in a program that was providing um, case management and representative payee services to people who had um, psychiatric disabilities. And what I discovered was that all of, not the identical people, but the same people, the kids that I had been working with because of changes in funding streams, when they turned 18, they aged out of any residential programs and they immediately became homeless. And that's what happened. In the 80s, I was seeing people who, you know, had been the same generation of kids that I had been working with in the 70s. And seeing the experiences that they were having and seeing the environments, if they were living inside, was like appalling to me. I really it was like, wow, the environment, people's environment is primary to their physical but also their mental health. And if this is mental health treatment, you know, if Sixth Street in San Francisco is considered aftercare from an inpatient hospitalization, people just might as well shoot themselves. It was appalling. And immediately that's what struck me is that, you know, 
all of my life I had been working towards better practices of healing and mental health. And at this point, I started working for any healing and mental health and maybe an entrance into a system because the other thing that was impossible for people to get was actual treatment. I mean, it wasn't, it, it was amazing. And so I began, you know, in, in, I had not been politically active um, since the Vietnam War. I'd been really, really immersed in this community and learning. And, and so seeing this stuff, I was just like, wow, this is so bad. And there's no separating, there's no separating people's individual lives from the health of the community. And the community um, was very ill. And it brought home to me the fact that, you know, while I had been living and working in this idealized place in Berkeley, it was, you know, heaven in one sense, that it was very isolated from the rest of the world. And when I sort of woke up from this mystical dream, um, as such as it were, and realized that there were, you know, while, while I had been living poor for years and had grown up poor, I wasn't, didn't know anything about what it was like to be forced to live in the conditions that people were living in in the Tenderloin in San Francisco simply because of their disability. SSI is not enough to live on. And why are people on SSI? They're on SSI because they're too disabled to work. So basically, disability immediately um, assigns people to a state of poverty. And that disability is usually a result of trauma and violence that they've experienced in their lives. Usually, I mean, my experience has been that there's trauma involved in people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And whether, whether the trauma is as a result of the disability or the disability is as a result of the trauma, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, that's... I mean, I, I have, in, in the 30 years that I've been doing this, I would say that 98% of all homeless people, certainly that I've worked with, but I've heard this from other, this data also from other providers of health services, 98% of all homeless people, both men and women, were sexually traumatized as children. And I see that now as part of a, the larger institutional trauma that goes on that are um, one of the bases you know, one of the pieces of the groundwork that happens when people become homeless. There's a reason for it, and it usually involves a personal trauma that ends up being turned into an institutional trauma. Um, people are taken, children are taken from their homes and placed into foster care, where they're then abused, placed into another foster care, where they're abused, again, sent to juvenile mental health, then juvenile justice, and a lot of those kids go to the street when they're 13, 14, years old and that's interestingly enough the age that they seem to stay at is developmentally and physically is the age that they went to the street and all of those kids have a similar story it's appalling and there are a lot of different you know this is just one particular group of people that I've been working with it's a lot of different um, ways that people end up on the street but the majority of it really is through people with disabilities being assigned a role in society of poverty, of impoverished, and therefore without value, valueless. There is no value in someone who is disabled. Because we live in a society where productivity and going to work is seen as the be-all, end-all of, of giving you value. Well, it's money. I mean, it's just about money. If you can't make money for someone, if you're not a commodity, um, if you're not a voting block, you know, you're just not, you don't have any value. And I think that you're even more devalued if you happen to fall into the category of someone with a disability who's also someone of color, someone who with a disability of color who's female or transgendered. It's like there is an addition, um, each, you know, particular um, stigmatized category that you are part of gives you um, even more less value to the point where you then become reviled hated, completely dehumanized, you're not seen as human. And, you know, no wonder people are traumatized, um, certainly traumatized by the experience of homelessness, um, simply the way that people are treated by housed people when they're homeless is enough to make you crazy. 
If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and we are speaking with Mary-Kate Connor, who is a psychiatric survivor and founder of the Caduceus um, Agency that works with homeless people and mental health issues in San Francisco. We were talking earlier about the role of the criminal justice system because, as you were saying, the, the services aren't funded and there isn't uh, money and budgeting there to provide with, for people's needs, but there is money for the criminal justice system, and so that plays a really central role in uh, the lives and experiences of homeless people. Tell us about your experiences um, and views towards that. I hope I can do that without crying because this, this is the single, to me, most devastating outcome of the last 30 years of, you know, basically funding and then defunding and then funding and then defunding mental health. But essentially the, the, the complete destruction of anything that looks like treatment um, that's not institutional. And that is that, and this is important that, that, that your listeners and that, everybody kind of pay attention to this statistic. And the first thing about the statistic is that it came from the U.S. Department of Justice. This is not a statistic that came from some fringe organization. It's our own government that put this statistic out. It's the Department of Justice Bureau of Statistics. And the last census they did um, of prisons and jails in the U.S., was in 90, excuse me, in 2006. And it was a very comprehensive study. It's a very interesting one. I, I recommend that people take a look at it. You can go online to US DOJ Department of Statistics and find it. But in all forms of criminal justice incarceration, which would include federal, state, county, city jails, so there's prisons and jails, including um, privately contracted prisons, um, in all forms of those um, criminal justice incarceration facilities, 65% of incarcerated inmates have what is called a serious and disabling psychiatric illness. 65%. And that's up from 10 years. The survey is done once every 10 years. Actually, it was up from, yeah, in 10 years from a verified 20% 10 years before that. And I don't think that it's any mistake that this happened during um, the last administration, during Bush administration, but it was happening more and more and more. And the common, the common figure that was thrown around for a long time in the um, mid-90s and early um, part of this particular century is that, you know, it was like 15 to 20% of people that are in the criminal justice have serious psychiatric illness, 65%. And looking back at that data, it's like, okay, so what are the other numbers that go with that that are equally terrifying? Um, there are so many that I can't even tell you. And one of them is coming back around right now. In San Francisco, there were dire mid-year budget cuts from the um, mayor's office to the Department of Public Health. The cuts are so dire that they're talking about reversing um, what, what advocates worked for very, very hard. And I was one of those people who worked with um, policy folks um, in San Francisco to institute something that we are calling the single standard of care, which is whether you're insured or not, you get the same level of treatment in San Francisco from the mental health system. So you have the same number of visits with a therapist. If you want to take medication, the same kind of medication, you don't have to take a, you know, a worse or lesser brand, all of these kinds of things. So essentially what's happened is that uh, we've closed the state hospitals and the, the big asylums and then just put people in, in prisons and jails. That's basically what's happening. There was a period of, I think of California as being, you know, like the, as so goes California, so goes the rest of the country. We were the first ones to deinstitutionalize. And what was supposed to happen in every state that was adopting this program was that the money that had been spent incarcerating people in giant institutions, warehousing them for their whole lives, was supposed to then go to the communities with them to where they were returning to to provide community mental health care. 
in San Francisco um, from 1970 to 1978 was paradise. We had the most beautiful community mental health care. Um, one of you know, dur- surveys that were done during that time. Clearly, the solution isn't to rebuild the state hospitals. Um, one of the things that's being pushed is the idea of, well, provide people with treatment in prisons, have mental hospitals inside of the prison system. Right. How do you feel about that as a, as a solution? I think it's just so wrong. It's so wrong. There is treatment in prison. After the glory days of community mental health, when the and, you know, when deinstitutionalization took place and we had these 10 years of actual community mental health, and I could go on and on about how great that is, Proposition 13 happened. Every single non-essential service that was paid for by the state was defunded. And the only ones that came back were libraries, and they sort of did. Mental health didn't really come back. And it got worse from there. So what what we used to joke about, providers in the city used to joke about, is the only way that you can get pres- treatment is if you go to prison, because there was more, there was more treatment available in prison inside the California Department of Corrections than there was in the city and county of San Francisco. If you were depressed, you had to be suicidally depressed. You had to meet the criteria for involuntary hospitalization in order to get treated. You could get more treatment in San Quentin than you could in the city and county of San Francisco. And I think that also holds for substance abuse and addiction treatments as as well. And the, the answer is not providing treatment in prison. Prison makes people sick. It is not it is not an environment, regardless of how much treatment or what kind, that people will ever get well inside of. What the answer is, is to somehow magically reinvest every human being with the worth that they were born with and to stop seeing 65% of the population as being completely expendable and the only thing that we can do with them is disappear them. There is an entire segment of the population that has been subjected to mass incarceration. Those are all people with psychiatric illnesses, and that should terrify you and all of your listeners. The whole prison industrial complex issue is a really important part of what's wrong with the mental health system. The criminal justice needs to be reformed, and when we talk about mental health policy, we really have to talk about criminal justice policy at the same time because they're so connected. They are, and unfortunately what's happened, there is a a federal project called the Consensus Project, and it's between the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services, and it is basically sort of combining and doing reform in a combined way between mental health and the criminal justice system. But what it's doing is reforming it to the point where it's like, oh, well, if we can only have special mental health courts and we can have special mental health jails. It's like, no, we don't need mental health, special mental health court and special mental health prison. We need to um, radically change the criminal justice system, you know, decriminalize um, things like drugs. We need to not be locking people up in the first place and be figuring out ways to provide voluntary services in the community to help people to prevent the people from getting to the point of crisis and deal with homelessness and deal with um, the needs that people have before they reach that point of ending up in the criminal justice system or the mental health system. And it's not impossible. These are not things that are, you know, just sort of delusional dreams. They're not at all. It's entirely possible to do this. We live in the richest country in the world, and California, where you're calling from, is the richest part of the richest country, and yet we have this constant politically and ideologically motivated mantra of there's not enough money, there's not enough money. There is enough money. It's just who has it. We don't have it. The programs that need it don't have it. And that's the real political question is where, where is the money going and how do we have a, a real, um, how do we have an honest um, policy in our country of funding social needs rather than locking people up? Uh, Mary Kay, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to hear a little bit about the Caduceus um, project that you created. I started Caduceus in 1996 exactly for all the reasons we just talked about, um, and primarily because homeless people were seen as not even worthy of treatment because homeless people were somehow even a lesser um, kind of disabled person than just a regular crazy disabled person. 
and I wanted psychiatry to understand that um, just like, you know, attorneys are required to do pro bono service and come and work for the good of the community, why doesn't psychiatry do that? Why can't psychiatry come to the streets and make make mental health treatment relevant to people rather than having people go into a clinical environment that's completely off-putting in every way and to meet someone else's expectations. And I also wanted to do this without any government money whatsoever so that, number one, nobody could tell us what to do or what to say, and number two, so that our funding could be cut. You know, So it's this whimsical process of depending on who says that there's money and who doesn't, whether treatment is funded. And you cannot provide treatment based on whether one year there's money and one year there's not. It's just, you know, if that were the way that my health care was being provided, I would sue for malpractice. So I started Caduceus with the intent of bringing um, doctors to the street rather than having people go to doctors and understanding and causing psychiatrists to understand that they are physicians and that there is a lot more to healing than simply providing somebody a pill, that they have special skills, that they're trained to do things like take somebody's blood pressure and, you know, like talk to them about their bodies and look at the different ways that the mind-body interaction could really help someone change the way they think about themselves. And I also wanted homeless people to understand that there are psychiatrists in the world that are doctors that are not all powerful and that won't lock them up. And the only way to find those docs was to find docs that would volunteer their time. And I spent a year looking for doctors that would do that. The only doctors that came to work for Caduceus for free after a year of looking were queer people and people of color. Surprise, surprise. And we attracted a phenomenal roster of amazing, amazing people, psychiatrists who really wanted to do this work who really wanted to come in and work with the community at a very deep level, flying under the radar, so not having to deal with bureaucracy, not having to deal with not having to deal with bureaucracy, not having anything between you and the person you're working with. So you can make that powerful connection. That's really where the healing takes place. What services do, does Caduceus um, provide? We do just a ton of different stuff. And... Um, pretty much anything that, that someone needs that's going to work in their lives. And that could range from um, what might be, pardon me, the most useful thing for somebody right now it would be a place to come and sleep in the daytime, take a little um, bird bath in the bathroom, have something to eat, and be with other people where they're going to be safe um, and not have to talk, not have to, to give anybody their social security number or anything else. Um, but we do criminal justice advocacy. We represent people in the courts. We help to mitigate really um, punitive probation and parole. Okay, here's my little program description. The services we provide include psychiatric treatment and medications within three days of entering our services if people want. Um, and that's in comparison to six to eight weeks in most city-funded outpatient clinics. Um, psychiatric case management, which is pretty complicated and what that involves is basically keeping people um, off the backs of people who are homeless and have the disabling conditions. Um, pharmacy liaisons, which is trying to help people figure out how to get medicine if that's what they want because it's really complicated. Um, helping people store their medication um, and figure out how to take it safely if that's what people want to do because the cops, when they um, roust people and shake them down, they take their medicine and throw it away or they arrest them for it. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, it's just amazing what the cops do. So we have also have drop-in um, psychiatric clinics where people can drop in and see their doc if they want to. Um, we have permanent and supportive housing applications and advocacy, and we also do emergency housing for people for you know very brief periods of time. Um, we do successful benefits advocacy and applications like 100% and I'm bragging here, so I'm probably going to be struck down for saying this, but 100% of SSI applications we do get awarded on the first app. 
and that's pretty amazing. Criminal justice, um, case management and advocacy in the courts, um, a welcoming, safe drop-in space that provides respite from the streets um, with food, phones, computers, private bathroom, art supplies, a living room, um, and all of this is designed to reflect the worth and the value of people that use our services and shared community with others who are not going to fear or judge or blame them for having become outcast by society. How many people and, do you serve there and what kinds of successes have you seen in terms of people being able to feel safer and get their lives more together and then maybe also move on from, from living on the streets? Well, a lot of, I mean, I think the majority of people that we've worked with over time um, have gotten benefits and have gotten housing. But just like your life and my life are not going to be an even trajectory all the time, they're going to have spots where they're going to need a lot more help again in the future. I have people that I've been working with for 10 and 15 years that come and go, and they're part of this community. People that have become housed still come back to hang out with us Um, because this is a really good place with really good people. And it's a very exclusive club. We call ourselves Caduceans. Uh, You're from the land of Caduceus, and Caducea is a rare and amazing place. Um, We're kind of proud of our community, and we're proud that we're different. Um, And I don't discuss, nor do I choose to disclose um, the fact that I have been um, a patient in the mental health system. I don't disclose it to my clients because I don't want them to worry about me. I don't want them to worry about my health. Um, And that's what has happened in the past where people have been concerned. It's like, oh, I can't tell her that because it'll hurt her feelings. She's so sensitive. And the other aspect of it is that it is something that there is still so much stigma attached to that politically it will cost me, especially in a budget year like this year. We did end up taking money from city services because we were at year 10, year 11 actually, broke. I mean, we were about to close. And used some influence in the Board of Supervisors and were able to get funded. Our budget has been cut entirely. Our entire budget has been cut. If someone wanted to block the advocacy efforts that are going to be done on behalf of Caduceus, one of the first things they would do is attack me publicly, which they've also done to my life partner and husband, Paul Bowden, who ran the coalition, San Francisco Coalition on Homelessness. The personal attacks are really vicious. And the first thing they'll do is say, well, she's incompetent. That's why she's out of money. Um, And it's like, you know, it's not, because of the stigma that can be used to hurt is the only reason why it's not something I would come out about right now in this particular moment. And about how many people are um, are part of Caduceus? We serve about 100 people a year. And your budget annually is about what? 300000 So rel- relative to the costs of locking people up or hospitalizing people. Oh, I can people, tell you. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. I just did this cost breakdown, and we have, um, it, it's, I'm estimating it's probably a lot more than this. So it's $200 an hour for involuntary psychiatric treatment. So that means 48 hours of involuntary psychiatric treatment in a locked facility is $12,000. And it's $3,000 per year um, for a year of treatment at Caduceus. A year in jail, the cost of one month in jail. Um, for one person in in the San Francisco jail system is $3,750. The cost um, for one year is $45,000. And the, um, yeah, it just goes on and on. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing when you think about what helps people get well. And it's not involuntary treatment, and it's not jail. And this is cheaper. Is uh, Caduceus a model that could be reproduced around the country, you think, if there was the political will and the funding to do it? Yeah, I do. I think it certainly could be, and especially if there were clinicians that were willing to take the risk. I think that a model where it's both professional and non-professional, but everybody is treated equally as peers, um, the people that work there, it's not a peer-based model. But where clinicians 
um, especially, would be willing to take the risk of actually engaging at such a deep level with the people they're working with that they could say, honestly, I really love my clients. Mary Kate, it's really, it's just an honor to talk with you and to hear about your amazing work and congratulations on the successes. And I really hope that you're able to continue to get the funding and to spread this model. Now, if people want to get in touch with you to find out more about Caduceus, to support Caduceus, to make donations, um, how do they reach you? Well, you know, we're so ridiculously busy doing our work that we've never got it together to get a website. If you Google Caduceus Outreach Services, and I'll spell Caduceus, C-A-D-U-C-E-U-S, so it's Caduceus Outreach Services, there is a um, website that says yourdanceevents.com, and it's about the fourth listing on Google. That has our... um, for, for whatever reason, that has our newsletter on it, and it basically talks about all the stuff, and it has contact information. Do you have an email address or something that people could contact? Yeah, about? I do. My email is Mary Kate. It's all one word. Underscore Caduceus. That's C A D U C E U S at sbcglobal.net. We are just about out of time, but could you tell us real quickly, what does caduceus mean? The caduceus is a really ancient symbol. People generally associate it right now with um, the winged staff. Um, And you see that, you know, it's like the AMA uses it as their symbol. Um, You see it on doctors, on doctors badges and things, right? Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. But it's a much, much more ancient symbol than that. It goes back to beyond Sumerian. And it's traditionally meant um, beyond Roman, beyond, you know, it's, it's been seen in Egypt. It's been seen in a lot of different cultures. And it is um, the union of opposites to create balance. And that's why I chose it. Mary Kay Connor, thank you so much for joining us on uh, Madness Radio. And again, good luck with your really important work. Thank you, Will. Thanks for having me. And You've been listening to an interview with Mary Kate Connor. She's the founder and director of Caduceus Services in San Francisco, at focusing on working with innovative services for homeless people with mental health issues. This is Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. We will see you next week. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJ LPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Co produced by peer run mental health communities, freedom center.org and the Icarus Project.net. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall. Music producer is John Rice, with technical assistance from Jeremy Lansman. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help get us broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.